lifting up Jesus and opening his word from Australia, Denmark, Israel, Japan, New Zealand, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, Singapore, South Africa, United Kingdom, Thailand, the Philippines, United States, and throughout the world. You're watching Morial TV. Thank you for your question, and it is a good question for young believers. <clears throat> I'll try my best to explain it. Please pay careful attention. We have to understand the nature of Scripture. As we've said many times, Jesus, the divine logos, Jesus, is the Scripture incarnate. The Scripture is Jesus in print. Jesus is the Scripture incarnate. Scripture is Jesus in print. Jesus is fully human and fully divine. He is God in man as the Logos. But the Scripture as the Logos is the Word of God in the Word of man. I just opened to Amos. That is 100% the Word of God but it is 100% the word of Amos. I can turn to Luke. Luke was a physician. You see an emphasis on medical detail and the healing miracles of Jesus in Luke. God draws on his human background. It's 100% the word of God, but it's 100% the word of Luke. Scripture is the word of God in the word of man. It doesn't make it any less human literature because it is divine. And it doesn't make it any less divine because it is human. Just think of Jesus himself, fully God, fully man. The fact that he was God did not make him any less human. There was an ancient heresy that taught it did called docetism. On the other hand, the fact that he was human did not make him any less God. There were other ancient heresies, such as Ebionism, which denied his deity. Well, think of the scripture the way you think of Jesus. Now, let's move into this issue of the Apocrypha. We've said before that the apocryphal books, particularly 1st and 2nd Enoch and 1st and 2nd Maccabees, are scripturally important history and literature. So are various other things, such as the Book of Yaddish. <clears throat> and we have Old Testament references to things like the Books of Wars. These are not canonical in the sense that they are not a basis of doctrine. They are not canonical in the sense that they are not a basis of doctrine. Nonetheless, God did include them in the canon of Scripture as history and literature. We cannot base doctrine on the apocryphal books, but we can use the apocryphal books as history and literature to understand doctrine. Jesus in John chapter 10 celebrated Hanukkah, translated the Feast of Dedication in the New Testament. Daniel predicted the epic of the Maccabees and what would happen. It has a future prophetic meaning for the Antichrist who will come in the character of Antiochus Epiphanes, but it was still historically fulfilled approximately 160 years before Jesus as Daniel prophesied. The historical recording of it, however, is not in Scripture. It is in the Apocrypha. Yet Jesus lent credibility to it by celebrating Hanukkah, celebrating a holiday, a religious holy day, based on history, not based on anything that was actually in Scripture. The Hebrew Feast of Esther is, is, is similar. Uh, was not in the prescribed holy days given by Moses. Nonetheless, except, of course, the book of Esther is canonical, while the, while the Apocrypha is not. 
Nonetheless, it is scripturally important history and literature. We cannot base doctrine on it. We can base doctrine on Daniel and say, this is the historical record proving that Daniel was right and how Daniel's prophecies played out in history and how it teaches us about the Antichrist to come. It's scripturally important history and literature, but that alone is not the basis of doctrine. Let me look at another example of this. Turn with me, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, another issue. Paul is dealing with the issue of divorce and remarriage among believers, and what happens if you get saved, become a believer, and you have an unsaved husband or wife who leaves you and goes off with another. That's the issue he's dealing with in the seventh chapter of 1 Corinthians. Now, look at what he says, how careful he is. Verse 8, but I say to the unmarried and to the widows, it's good for them if they remain even as I am. Okay, <clears throat> uh, but he makes it very clear when he is speaking by way of command and when he is speaking by way of not divine instruction, but sanctified opinion. In verse 6, but this I say by way of concession, not of command. In other words, in verse 6, this is my sanctified opinion. It's not a command of God. Yet God puts it in his word. But when we come down further, verse 12, but to the rest I say, not the Lord. Now it's, this is not my opinion. This is what God actually says. He continues this way. <clears throat> and he goes on and he draws further distinctions. And he says in verse 25, concerning virgins, I have no command of the Lord, but I give you an opinion. Notice what Paul does in 1 Corinthians 7. This is my opinion, thus saith the Lord. This is my opinion, thus saith the Lord. It draws a distinction between the word of Paul and the word of God. Yet God inspires it be included in the canon. The only doctrine Paul's opinion teaches is we cannot base doctrine on opinion but it makes a distinction. It's 100% the word of Paul and 100% the word of God. Yes, it's in the canon of scripture, but Paul did not base a doctrine on it, either did Jude. Well, let's go further. Let's look at this other issue of uh, the quotation or the citation of a pagan poet. The only thing Paul was saying is, <clears throat> look, you people were saved out of paganism. Even when you were pagans, you knew there was an afterlife. We're magio dei beings made in God's image and likeness. Even unsaved people have this sense that there's a judgment day and that there's an afterlife. Even as pagans, you knew that. Because we're made in God's image and likeness, you would have known that. He elaborates more on this in Romans, of course. These things are included in the canon of Scripture. They help understand and explain doctrine, but they're not the basis of doctrine in themselves, although they're in there. Whenever you see citation of something not canonical in the sense of doctrine included in the canon, God inspired it to be put there. It's part of his word, but it is not on its own merit, any basis for doctrine. It's there to help us to understand doctrine. I hope this clarifies matters. Thank you for your question. My name is Jacob Prash.